people to let in. Hello. Ted. Hi. Good evening. How are you? Doing well. So we've got, uh, including ourselves, we've got five people. Okay. So let's, let's give it a few. I mean, we're 10 minutes before the oh, start. Oh, we're still early. Yes. Yeah. So let's, I just like to start early in case there's people hanging out. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I did an earlier program at uh, three, was it three? Three o'clock today. And that was uh, on, oh, well, you better answer that, Owen. That, that was on uh, the bombing of Japan. The, the 75th anniversary. Um, I'm sorry, he's busy right now. He's doing a, a so, Zoom phone. So yeah, of course, phone. the phone doesn't ring all day, but now that I have you on the yeah, phone, sure. come on, who wants to talk to <laughs> Who was it? Oh. Yeah, I'll call him back. So it was a beautiful day. Yes, very nice out. I spent a fair bit of time sitting outside, enjoying mm -hmm. the weather. It's very nice. And how are you feeling? Good, I'm feeling good. So am I. So <clears throat> this is recording now, so. Okay, good. <laughs> as soon as I start the meeting, I said I set it to automatically record. Sure. Okay. And it's in the cloud, so um, I will have to rely on some of our more te techie members to get it out of the cloud and onto our YouTube channel. <laughs> All right, very good. Very good. So we had a, uh, our contractor was here today doing some repair work. Uh -huh. So um, wearing a mask. He's very good, he's a very good uh, guy. Good. <laughs> Usually he does it when we're in California. But this year, of course, we You're were. <laughs> you, were, you were stuck with us all winter, <laughs> except uh, you didn't see too much of us because of the the COVID chased us, huh? Yeah. Yeah, really. Well, that still goes on. California, Arizona, Texas, Florida, Alabama. Yeah. <clears throat> spikes in the number of people infected. Yeah. yeah. Not here, though. No, no. That's good. Let's it's hope it's safe. Opening, I think. Yeah, let's hope people continue to take precautions. Huh? Yeah. Um, I actually was out Sunday. A friend of mine uh, came down to Hyde Park, and <clears throat> we went to we went out to brunch to a place uh -huh. near me. Okay. And, you know, outside, tables sufficiently apart. Servers and everybody, all the all the staff masked. So, yeah, now, yeah, everybody was behaving. <laughs> well, Elaine is here. Yeah, I <laughs> Hi, Elaine. No Paul's. Oh yeah, Paul's on. What she doesn't hasn't just hasn't activated. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, I've got oh. uh, Paul oh. and Blake and Glenn. Uh oh, I just touched. Um, you're fine. This? The corner. Yeah. Oh dear. Oh dear. No, I lost. Okay, Lynn, what do I do? I lost the picture. Oh no. Getting started with Zoom. I can't join. I no. can see you. I oh, can't. No. Hit it over here. Where? There. Oh, here. Yeah, I'm sorry. All there right. you go. Okay, let me. Take it. <laughs> you know what? I... Oh, it went out again. Just a second now. Okay. A couple more people I to touched. come in. I well, I won't touch anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Until well, you Peter's have to. Still there. Oh, Anne. Oh, a couple more people. Hi, right now. Anne is a friend of mine. Okay. Hi, Anne. Okay. Welcome. All right. Okay, yeah, do yours. Then do yours. Do yours. Do yours. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Anne. I don't see you, Anne. She's got her video off. Yeah. yeah. She does. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you people can either come well, in right. with or without yeah. video. It's up to them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then for the then you could say for the future. Yeah. Yeah. But then and you know what? Maybe you just maybe you just give them my. I mean, I don't know if you're on my website, but I have a 
whole website on it, you know. Uh, but but you could, you, I'm gonna take, pick, I, I'll, I think that's probably the best, just take the first paragraph, take the first paragraph that you like, because you know what you like. Um, well, thus far we have three people okay. with both backgrounds. Right. I got, um, okay, so I'm, I'm You have a nice background. <laughs> There's seven people on this recording, a friend of mine, so I have to go to this. Yeah. I'm going to have to let him do it. Because I'm doing it. All right, thanks. Yes, take care. Right, take care. Bye. Oh, a couple more folks. Okay. There we go. Oh, Jack Oaks is on. Jack is from California. Hello, what? Jack. Should I explain why I'm interested? A woman. <laughs> and, how, and why are you interested? Well, I think my professor of art history 70 years ago was one of the monuments men. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, cool. <laughs> and today, I, well, not today, but one of the recent things I do is research people who are architectural historians who have gotten really old or died or whatever. And I do this for the Society of Architectural Historians. And I found quite a number of monuments men and what they did. And it was absolutely amazing. For them, I look at the architectural aspect. at the house. But my art history professor was quite strong on this whole thing. Architectural story. And as I worked at the Art Institute for 16 years, I was aware of the stolen art and it helped with the searching and that uh, documentation. Right. Sure. Well, I, I, thought, I, you I might hope. be interested in why not only as a cliff dweller, yeah. but as a person in the field, I'm interested. Very good. Well, hopefully I won't, I won't make too many mistakes. <laughs> and there's Jana. Hi, Jana. Janice. Hi. Oh, Jan. Janet Kemp. Hi, Luigi. Luigi is oh, my neighbor. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Ed. How are you? Hi, everybody. Hi, there. How are you? Good, good. Well, we're I'm just, a lot of people there. Yeah, that's great. I'm just about to get myself a bowl of ice cream before I sit down. So <laughs> go right ahead. Well, you'll find we've got, we've got time yet. Yeah, it's not even seven o'clock, and probably get wait a few minutes after that just to let you know make sure everybody. Yeah, no, there. we still have a few more minutes. Yeah, no, not drinking any wine, folks. Uh, I'll do that <laughs> over. All right, now Luigi, have... I'll be joining you with some Campari here shortly as well. That's right. Well, there is. Uh, I will be mentioning uh, how the Nazis also stole wine. <laughs> We're going to that tonight. They stole everything you can imagine. I'll broaden your. Mm. Hello, Anne. Okay. So I, I think you will find this a uh, interesting, shocking, a little humorous, uh, etc. We got record. Right. Yeah, we are recording. And I set it to do, I uh, start recording automatically when I started the meeting, you know, I uh, started the meeting, so. Well, it was a beautiful day today. I hope all of you had a good day. Tell anybody that wants, tell, hey, Ella and Jean, if you want to see a great, somebody named Luigi Jack H. Oh, I don't have oh, my. There he is, Jack H. Uh, he knows me. Yes, I know him. Yeah, where's your picture? <laughs> Not everyone has their video on, Ed. <laughs> oh, I, I understand that. Well, this Jack H. I've uh, is a friend of mine. I've known since we were about 1970. <laughs> cool. So uh, even before, no, about that was about or 69, even. Yeah. But we have folks on here from. Uh, Idaho, California, and Chicago thus far. So, uh, and a number of cliff dwellers. A lot of people coming. Still got people coming. Good. Very good. I think as it's now seven o'clock, we'll probably give it, a, let's give it a few more minutes. That's fine. Because I'm sure <coughs> people are saying, oh, it's seven o'clock. I'd better get on there. <laughs> Was 
That's Peggy Luce. Hi, Peggy. Hello. Hi. We're just waiting a few oh, more minutes before we get started. Yeah, just to give uh, people a little, ex little time to join us. Just give it a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Well, uh, Luigi's there. Oh, good. My hand is up there. Just stay here. Okay. Oh, there's Andrew. I see Barbara. That might be Barbara Badger. Yeah. A few people have pictures. You can sit there. I can sit here. We have people still joining. Okay. Well, we got 20 people at the moment. Okay, they don't all have their. Here comes Annie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One second. Yeah, come on, they're waiting for you. <laughs> That's right, the world is waiting. <laughs> Oh, oh, there's a Janice. Here we all are. <laughs> oh, wow. Sit down. All right, one more. I'm 21. Pretty well. I know we're at 22. Yes. I give it maybe one more minute and then we'll start. Okay. Well, there, no one wants this room after us, so we're all right. <laughs> we're good. Yeah. But there's there's hand. Uh, hand. The other hand. That's okay. I just have a pen. Here, here, here's a pen, here's a paper. Yeah, in case I need to take notes. If you want to see weird old people, yeah, yeah well, it's you know. <laughs> our picture eating. <laughs> there at the cliff. Another band, yeah. Uh, it works. All right, it's uh, 7 03. We've got 22 people uh, on, the, on the Zoom call. So I think we should get started. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Joan Pantsios, and I am the program chair at Cliff Dwellers. Uh, when Ed suggested this program, I thought it'd be a great idea. It's kind of the, we've done a book club a couple of times on Zoom, but we haven't done an actual program. So this is an experiment, hope it works out. Um, uh, just a few things before we get started. First of all, I'm gonna ask everybody, except Ed, of course, uh, to please mute yourself so we don't get any background yeah, noises during, uh, during the talk. There will be a question and answer period after Ed's talk. And what I'm gonna do is ask you to put your questions in the chat. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a bar that, where it says mute, stop video, et cetera. There's a, an icon for chat. And so if you please use that to uh, answer, just type your questions into that. I want everybody to know that we are recording this, uh, video recording, and uh, if we can get our tech people to do it, they may be able to get it on the Cliff Dwellers YouTube channel, which would be wonderful. Um, Ed is, in addition, going to talk. He's also going to be sharing some images. Uh, when he starts to share the screen, I think the best um, layout for you all is to, to, if you want to see Ed while he's sharing his screen, yeah. you can go up to these little icons. Uh, there's one, it's, you'll see one that's kind of like a little grid if you're in gallery view. If you click on that, and go to speaker view, that'll let you see uh, the speaker. But then when he starts to share, you'll, you can go up to the top again and you'll see view options. 
And if you go to that and say, show active speaker, and you'll want the side-by-side -side view, and that'll give you his screen on one side of yours and his image on the other. And you right. can make, you can adjust the, um, the relative size of those two images. So I, I think that's a really good way to look at things when people are uh, sharing. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ed. I'm sure many of you know him already, but for those who don't, uh, Ed is a historian, speaker, researcher, and author. He's taught history at DePaul University in Chicago, and he was a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians for 10 years. He's presented hundreds of historical programs across America to museums, libraries, universities, historical societies, professional groups, trade associations, alumni organizations, and community groups, and to the Cliff Dwellers on more than one occasion. Uh, Ed is also president and founder of Imperial Consulting Corporation. Uh, his latest book, uh, is divided by divided on D-Day, how conflicts and rivalries jeopardized the Allied victory at Normandy. This was co-authored by David Ramsey and published by Prometheus Books. Dr. Gordon earned his BA and MA degrees in history at DePaul, his PhD at Loyola University in Chicago, and pursued postgraduate studies <coughs> at the University of Chicago. And he has been a literary member of Cliff Dwellers since 2000. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ed. All right. Okay, no, okay. Is, all right, folks. All right, okay. Oh, no, come on now anyway. Split screen, is it going to well? Got some more people joining. I'm, I'm trying to share yes. screen. Right? Share screen. Yeah, yeah clicking it. Yes, that's doing it. Ask Joan if she's... Down at the bottom, Ed, you'll see uh, in that bar, you should see a green thing that says share screen. Yeah, I'm hitting it and it's not working. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, not again. Oh, oh. dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. All right. What do I do? Let, hang Listen. on. I'm going right. to go in. Oh, we did this, had this problem last time. Yes. Um, let me go in and see what I can do about that. Hang on, everyone. Okay, guys. <laughs> All right. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Ed. Why did I do that? All right. We're waiting for her to let me. Uh, yeah, I have to. Uh, we did this once before, and we had the problem, and I figured out how to do it, and now I can't remember how to do it. Okay. <laughs> um, if you just join, put it. Uh, put your microphone on mute, if you would. All right. You can Sorry. click on your name, Elizabeth, and then you'll be able to. There'll be, or there's a, either security. Click on your yeah. name and you'll see. I'm looking. I'm sorry, what was that? You can click make on your name. Host. Make him the host. You click on your, if you click on your name, Hang your on. picture. Hang on. Oh, there. I, yeah, I have to keep confusing this because it's not actually me. Um, so I click, yeah, I have to click on Ed and make him a co host, I think. Yeah, you click on your name and then you can make him the host. Yeah. I, I think I have to click on his name to do that. Uh, there we are. There's Edward. Okay, I'm making you host. Okay. So I'm changing the host to you are now the, the host. So you yeah. might need to switch that back to me when we do the yeah. Q&A. Yeah. Okay. Right. You probably won't need to, but anyway, you can okay. share the slides now. All okay. Right. So now uh -huh. you should be able to share your screen. All right, now we do this. No, it's this one. Is that, why is it working? It takes a while. Right, let's do this one. This one. Oops. What's in the corner? That takes trouble. Share. There. Sure. It is. Okay. There you go. All right. Now you see me and you see the slides, right? Everybody, good. Well, good evening and welcome to the Monument Men and their mission. And and we are actually seeing your entire screen, so we're seeing your in presenter view. Um, we're seeing, so we're seeing all of your slides on the side as well as the one you want to show. Okay. So you want to maybe switch that over? Well, not necessarily. No, not okay. necessarily. If you don't mind us seeing all what's coming up. It's, it's fine. This is fine the way it is, all right? Okay. So in the 1930s, <laughs> all right, oops, oops, oops. 
Maria Altman visited her uncle Ferdinand. She was a little girl and she, she always admired the portrait of her aunt by Gustav Klimt, the golden Adele that hung in the aunt's bedroom with three other landscape paintings. In 1938, the Nazis came and took all of these paintings away. Ultimately, Maria fled to California with her husband, where she lived a long and fruitful life. Later, she returned to Austria and she discovered the Golden Adele in the Austrian National Gallery in Vienna. In 1999, she began the effort to recover that painting for her, for her family. This is the story of the greatest looting of art in the history of civilization by a criminal regime and how much of it has been recovered and the battle that still continues today to recover art and many other artifacts stolen by the Third Reich. So here's our program. We will cover the war, what went on that behind the theft movement, and then the post-war effort to recover this art. Adolf Hitler, the origin of the ideology of hate. Before the war, Adolf Hitler was nothing. After World War I, he was rejected as an artist to an uh, art academy. And at the same time, uh, he attempted to sell his art in Vienna. I don't know if it's unmuted. The era in Vienna was poisonous. And he picked up at that time a great deal of anti-Semitic hatred, both before World War I and after World War I. He then joined the Nazi party in its incipient form where there were just a few members. This was the enemy. All the ideologies, philosophies, religious theories that violated his creed of anti-Semitism, anti German racial superiority, and the right to Germany to dominate Europe and much of the world. Part of what he did was the confiscation of what he would call degenerate art. This art was impressionist art of modern and contemporary art. Hitler hated this art and he destroyed a great deal of it before he began to sell it to raise money to help finance Germany's rearmament. In Munich in 1938, 37, I'm sorry, he opened a art gallery to show what Germanic art should look like with a great parade that day of German art. The opening of the Temple of Art was Nazi ideas, racist ideas, nonsensical concepts of classic German Nordic art. Well, you can see, well, here's Hitler with uh, some of his, uh, with Goebbels, etc. First, Hitler had a prominent role in his own museum, as you can see. In fact, uh, Hitler had a photographer and all those pictures you see of, of Hitler, all the propaganda, he received royalties from all of this garbage that was produced by the Nazis uh, during the time of his regime. And also idealized Nordic figures. Well, the show flopped and Hitler ended up buying most of this art for the Nazi government. Now at the same time, the Germans took a rundown building a few blocks away 
and started an exhibition of degenerate art. These were 113 artists on display gathered from museums in Germany and Austria. You know, degenerates like Monet, Cezanne, Pizarro, etc., etc. Hundreds of their works were on display for over five months. Two million people attended this art exhibit. The Nazis were so infuriated with this that they shot the exhibit down. And here is some of the art, and you can see how uh, poorly it was displayed. It was all crammed together in these small rooms, but it was still a very, very popular exhibit. Well, now enters on the stage one of our uh, black guard, Hilda van Gerlich. He and other German art dealers were selected to market this art and to dealers and museums across Europe. Some of these made its way ultimately to the United States and even to the Art Institute of Chicago. On September 1st, 1939, the Nazis invaded Europe. First in Poland, and then in 1940, the Low Country, and then France, and then, of course, Eastern Europe. By 1941, most of Europe and large parts of the European Soviet Union were under German control. This began the ultimate Nazi confiscation of art and other treasures that was unprecedented in modern history, even greater than the theft by the Romans of Greek art in the ancient world, or even of Napoleon, the theft of art that he conceived across uh, his empire. Here is Nazi-occupied Europe at its greatest extent. 25% of the resources of Europe that financed the Second World War for Germany were from confiscated art treasures from individuals, museums, churches, galleries, governments, libraries, and other many other surprising sources that you'll see. Now, of course, before the war, before the invasions, these galleries knew a war was coming and they were afraid of bombing, principally. Remember, the French had the largest army in Europe in 1940. Everyone thought that it would defeat the Germans in short order. But here's the Louvre taking wing victory away to store in a safe place. This was followed in England, the Netherlands, Italy. They began removing art to protected places. The art was very carefully packed, inventoried, and hidden. And I'm happy to say much of this art was never discovered by the Nazis. When the Germans marched into Paris, in June of 1940, they established the so-called Arts and Monuments Protection Office. They began to catalog all of the art they found. Now here is Field Marshal von Rundstedt at the Louvre. He was one of the generals that helped to conquer France in 1940. In the First World War, when Rundstedt was a young officer, he saw the looting and pillaging and destruction that the German army had caused in Belgium and parts of France. He was determined this was not going to happen this time. So he took all of these art treasures that they found and put them in the Louvre. And he ringed them with troops. He went out to the cathedrals, even the great vineyards of Bordeaux, the chateaus of the Loire, and wanted to protect all of this architectural art and um, uh, libraries, etc. Ultimately, the Louvre was filled with art, 
and they moved more art into the Jus de Pont, which many of you have visited, both of these places, and all placed under guard. Well, now let's go back. Napoleon, until World War II, probably had the worst record of stealing art. Think of the three horses that were from Venice. He had them transported to the Louvre. After he fell, they went back to St. Mark's and Venice. Of course, remember the Venetians borrowed them from Constantinople when the Crusaders sacked Constantinople and they just happened to wind up in, um, in uh, Venice where they were protected by the Venetians. To get around this effort by the old guard German army to protect this art, Hitler and his posse, here they are, Goring, Goebbels, Hess, and others, decided that they would pass a series of laws to protect so-called abandoned art. He created the ERR, which was basically the Nazi confiscation organization, to save quote unquote art. And it would be divided into five categories of who would protect this art. One would be Hitler, second would be Goring, third would be other Nazi leaders like Himmler, Hess, fourth would be German museums, and fifth finally would be French museums. Now, what they could not confiscate, Hitler, Goring, and others would buy a greatly inflated Reich occupation currency. Hitler had always wanted, of course, to be an artist, as I told you before. And after World War I, he had failed to get into the Vienna Art Academy. Twice he failed. And he went into politics instead. Too bad for the world. Well, here is some of Hitler's art. Uh, this is the civil registry office in the old town hall of Munich. 1914, it was painted as a watercolor. Uh, yeah, this is one among 2,000 works that Hitler created as an artist. Unfortunately, I must tell you that this watercolor actually sold for $161,000 to uh, a, uh, in Nuremberg, to an, a Middle East collector. In, 19, in 2014. Now, even before World War II, Hitler began to collect art. Here is Himmler, the head of his SS, the people that ran the concentration camps, and he was presenting Hitler a present at his 50th birthday in 1939 in April. It was actually a portrait of Frederick the Great. Actually, that portrait ended up in Hitler's bunker in Berlin at the end of the war in 1945. It might have been one of the last things he was looking at before he killed himself. So now Hitler began to amass a huge art collection across Europe. And who helped him? Well, it was men like Gerlitt and other art dealers they roamed across Europe, buying, confiscating, and stealing. We were just in, in Ghent and saw the Ghent altarpiece that they came and confiscated and took away immediately after they had occupied Belgium. What was this all for? Well, Hitler planned a museum. He intended to build this museum to house his new collection. This was to be built in Linz, Austria, near the village where Hitler was born in Austria. Here is Hitler, a rare picture of Hitler with glasses, if you'll notice. And he is looking at the drawings of his new Linz library, or I'm sorry, uh, art museum, with the architect, Hermann Geisner. Now Hitler planned nothing on a small scale his museum would have dwarfed both the Paris Louvre or the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. 
In fact, his museum would have been three times the size of the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. I'm sure many of you have had the opportunity to go and see the Hermitage. We, my wife and I have, we only saw a small part of it and we were there for two days. So during World War II, Hitler amassed this collection and it continued to be uh, augmented by confiscating enemy alien property wherever the Nazis could steal it. Hitler's collection in 1933 when he became chancellor was zero. In 1945, he had 8,000 paintings, drawings, sculptures, and other fine work items. Well, he had other delusions. If the Germans had won, Hitler planned a new Berlin of enormous proportions. There it is. What you can see in the center field is the, Ar the German Ark of Triumph, 10 times the size of the Ark of Triumph of Paris. Picture here is Hitler with his favorite art architect, Albert Speer, working on the plans for the new Berlin. The new, the Third Reich planned a building for its rubber stamp Congress. It was called the Prachtstrasser. There it is. The dome was four times the size of St. Peter's. In fact, when you go to Berlin today and you go to the German History Museum, they have a whole section on World War II that does not glorify the Nazis, but explain the criminals that they were. They have the entire model of this that you see pictured here, that you can see for yourself. Berlin is German, it means swamp. Berlin was built on a swamp, like St. Petersburg, like Chicago. And when uh, they pictured this mon these monstrous building, Speer was afraid that they'd sink. So he took some stones in a park in Berlin that would approximate the weight of that dome and set them up to see if they would sink. You can go to that park today and guess what? The stones are, have sunk deep into the ground. <laughs> so this uh, delusion was a delusion that was not going to uh, obviously work for Adolf Hitler. And then of course, was the esteemed Goring collection. Goring was Hitler's heir apparent, the head of the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, and uh, Goring uh, also uh, loved art. And he was never unpleasant in his art dealings. He would arrive in Paris in a high spirits on his palatial private train, complete with an oversized bathtub and phalanxes of elegantly uniformed, uniformed attendants, and go from one gallery to another, all across Europe. On state occasions, Gordon restrained himself, but only a bit. He favored uniforms that he designed himself, often in white or pale blue or gray, and he changed outfits four or five times a day. He wore so many medals that the Germans joked very quietly that the decorations near the edge red continued on the back. Uh, Goring arrived at the Jeu de Palme in November 1940. The selection presented to him was staggering, eclipsing anything he had seen in Holland. He spent the entire day at the Jeu de Palme. He chose 27 paintings for himself, Dutch, French works, from the collections of the Rothschilds, the Wildensteins, among them Rembrandt's Boy with a Red Beret, and the magnificent Van Dyck Portrait of a Lady. This picture shows Goring presenting to an admiring Hitler some of his loot. After Goring's second visit, the confiscations continued. Truckload after truckload would appear at the door of the Jeu de Palme to be dumped there, often without any indication of provenance. These were all of the 
art that was being quote unquote protected. There were clocks, statues, paintings, jewelry, furniture, all from banks, private homes, warehouses, and abandoned apartments. The Nazis hunted for the Rothschild masterpieces with particular vengeance. They found them quickly and pronounced them, of course, abandoned. In all, they confiscated over 5,000 works from the Rothschild holdings, including Vermeer's, Raphael, Rembrandt's, Rubens, Titian, Goya, Van Eyck. But Goring began to consider himself a great art expert, but even the vaunted Reichsmarschall could be fooled. This book, The Forger's Spell, is about Dutch artwork from Bruges and other cities. It is about the great art forger Hans van Meter, a Dutch painter who specialized in forging Vermeer paintings, such as the one you're seeing now. Many of you already know that Vermeer paintings are very rare because he produced very few of them during his lifetime. So Van Mergen perfected the process of creating some that could be quote unquote discovered. Vermeer successfully sold this fake uh, Vermeer painting to Hermann Goring and many other fakes. Goring traded 137 paintings to buy this fake. Now after World War II, Vermeer was tried for treason by the Dutch as a collaborator. During the trial, art experts came to look at some of the paintings he had sold to Goring. Well, the art expert looked at this and they said, well, this is a fake. He fooled Goring. Because he had made Goring, sold him this fake art, he was actually acquitted. Later, this fake that you see sold for $23,000. I don't think it even looks like a Vermeer. Well, where did Goring take all this art? He styled himself something of a sportsman, so Goring built a small hunting lodge for himself. Here is his small lodge, Karen Hall, Goring's favorite of his, well, he had seven other houses too, but it was his favorite built with millions in state funds. Here he displayed his protected art collection. At the same time, outside, this is right outside Berlin, two hours, at the center of the sprawling park, he stocked bison, elk. Goring had a pet lion. Here it's pictured with his wife and Bonito Mussolini. Now Goring collected other things too, and upstairs, he had a model railroad. Uh, it was laid out with hundreds of fleet of track, toy airplanes and wire, on wire and rigged with bombs that could be dropped on the trains. In 1945, as the Russian army approached Berlin, Goring blew up Karen Hall. However, between April 1941 and July of 1944, over 4,000 cases filled with 130 38 boxcars and contained at least 22,000 lots were shipped out of the Third Reich. There had been much out to the Third Reich, I'm sorry. There was much discussion about where to keep all of this stolen art. Part of it, Hitler himself chose the pseudo medieval castle of Neuschwanstein, built by the Mad Kun Ludwig of Bavaria in a remote area near the Austrian border. But so vast were the holdings sent there that later shipments had to be distributed to even remote depots across Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. On June 6, 1944, the Allies invaded Europe. By August, they had finally broken out of Normandy, and the Germans really had to stop their looting. I mean, think about this, they were still looting. By then, the Nazis had raided 72,000 dwellings and shipped 
30,000 railway cars of loot to Germany. Pictured here are the gold bars of the National Bank of the Netherlands. The Germans also decided to move the art store in the Jeux de Pont. Here is Paul Schofield, who starred in the movie The Train. Most of you will remain, remember him and his role uh, as Thomas More. Also portrayed in this film is a famous heroine, Rose Vallon. Rose was the curator of the Jeux de Pont, and she had a secret record of all of the art treasures that were hidden from the Nazis. She wrote about how the museum's walls were stripped. The Germans packed up French's great art treasures for shipment to Germany. A special train was then commandeered to transport this priceless treasure to the Third Reich. In the 1964 movie, The Train, Burt Lancaster portrays a French railroad manager who's also a underground leader. With the help of Jean, he prevents Paul Schofield's German army officer from getting the train out of France. What actually happened is a lot less dramatic, but actually much more spine tingling. A steam engine that had been commandeered to drive these 12 boxcars was taken away and used to transport troops out of France to Germany. Instead, for two weeks, those boxcars filled with priceless art sat forgotten on a Paris suburb railway siding. It was finally discovered by Allied troops and luckily was not looted. Well, now let's talk about the recovery. As the war in Europe neared its end in 1944, the Allies appointed a Monuments Commission of Art to track down and return to its owners all of this looted art. An international team of art experts, some of whom are listed here, they were conservators, architects. These individuals were uh, deployed singly with backup army personnel and fanned out across Europe. In the movie that you saw, The Monument Men, you saw how they, two or three of them were always together. No, that's not how it worked. There were, these experts had teams and they scattered across Europe, both France and you'll hear about Italy in a moment. The first step involved in returning and gather, was gathering this loot from enormous recoveries like Goring's and Hitler's and countless smaller. There were 109 depots scattered across this map. Perhaps never before reported one visitor when he went to a warehouse where the recovered art was stored had such a collection of men's wealth been under one roof, including billions of dollars in gold bullion, most of Hungary's silver reserves, an entire room piled to the ceiling with canvas bags crammed with paper money. There were hogheads filled with precious stones, barrels of silver and gold watches, jewelry of every kind, and long sausages of threaded wedding rings stripped from the hands of women who had died in the concentration camps. As the Nazi art was gathered and their records were brought, they the monument men, or actually what they were called the Venus fixers by the army personnel, began to comprehend the staggering magnitude of this German operation. The more they learned, the less sympathy they had for those who had traded with and for the Nazis. The evidence of the cynical collaboration was devastating. The Third Reich's wartime version of looting was different than any other previous in the history because it was officially planned and expertly carried out and documented to enhance the fractured culture of the so-called master race. Patton's Third Army was racing across Germany 
and arrived in an area of southern Germany to a small German town of Merkers. On April 6th, a patrol of MPs found two women walking outside the town in violation of the curfew. After questioning, they, uh, they uh, were offered to drive the ladies into the town. And as they passed the entrance to, to the Kaiserstoda mine, the women said, oh, that's where the gold is kept. Well, their story was soon confirmed by others, prisoners of war, and they indicated the mine contained a large part of Hitler's gold reserves. And not just a bunch of old pictures. Well, after a few soldiers were caught with helmets filled with golden coins, Patton sent an entire tank battalion and 700 men to guard every possible entrance to that mine. Before anything was moved, the mine was inspected by General Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton, who later joked over dinner what they could have done with a treasure trove if they were freebooters in the days when the soldiers kept the loot. The Castle Neuschwanstein was intact and well guarded, and though it was clear from gaps in certain rooms that the ERR had made great efforts to remove what they had at the last minute, there were still 1,300 paintings in this castle. From Bavarian museums mixed in with French works, in the vault behind a steel door were po uh, boxes containing the Rothschild jewels, other precious goldsmith's work and thousands of pieces of silver from different collections. Best of all was a room containing all of the meticulous records kept by the Nazi ERR on 20,000 catalog cards. On May 8th, 1945, Patton's Third Army reached the Alt Assa Mine. This was the mother load. By its sheer magnitude, the largest Nazi depository of all. In a locked room, there were two, 200 by 30 feet, bricked up walls, concrete floors, were 600 high quality pain, paintings from the Rhineland Museums, sculptured works, stacks of pack cases. Here was the original manuscript of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. The oak, and, the oak doors of St. Maria in Capital of Cologne. In another room were six cases containing the gold and silver shrines from the, relic, the relics of Charlemagne, the robe of the Virgin, and the rest of the cathedral's treasure. George Stout, one of the most renowned of the monument men, compiled a list of just how much art the Nazis had stashed in this one hiding place. It contained over 6,500 paintings, 2,300 drawings and watercolors, 954 prints, 137 pieces of sculpture, and the tally went on and on and on. In another store in a yard were found 5,000 church bells taken from churches all over Europe and dumped in this yard. Well, how are we going to restore this art to the rightful owner? In 1945, at the Hilburn Mine, a self-portrait was found by Dale Ford and Harry Etlinger. Part two, much later in 2010, older Harry was posed at now the Kaushrow Museum. It took that long for it to be finally restored to that museum, this Rembrandt painting. It would take decades for much of the looted art to be returned to its owners or to the right museum, if at all.
Additional art restoration teams were also deployed into Italy. All of these allied teams across Europe were informally called by other army uh, people, the Venus Fixers. Here is a photo of the, of, uh, the book that you might uh, like to read for all of their efforts to find, restore, and prevent the destruction of fine art in Europe. In Italy, there were two issues, protection from Allied bombing, because remember Italy under Mussolini was uh, a fascist state and we invaded Italy. And secondly, once Italy left the war, preventing it to be stolen by the Germans and taken to Germany. A lot of Florence's art was stored at remote village sites outside of Florence. Here are some of the Venus fixers who worked in Italy that maybe, are, maybe some of you uh, have heard about or, or know. In 1945, as the Allies closed in, oops, all right. Just a moment. This is out of sync. Pardon me. Here's a Botticelli that the uh, that the Germans uh, did not confiscate and uh, did not steal. But here is another aspect a very fascinating book of how the Germans also stole the wine treasures of Europe. There were three wine Führers appointed by the Germans once they had taken France. One for Champagne, one for Bordeaux, and one for Burgundy. These three men uh, were basically the principal uh, dealers of uh, wine importing before the war. And they, uh, two of them, for Bordeaux and for Burgundy, made uh, deals with their French counterparts so that they would not, the Germans would not confiscate some of the rarest wines of those regions in their chateaus. Instead, they would uh, mix, they take bottles of Aubryon and put in other uh, similar vintages, but not rare vintages, and mix them in to cases to ship to Germany. And basically, they got away with, with the issue, but not in Champagne. The Champagne Fuhrer wanted the real stuff, so they pillaged Champagne. Of course, champagne generally is not kept for many years in storage, as you well know. When the Germans arrived in Paris, they went to the famous uh, restaurant, the Tower of Silver, Tour, Tour de Jean. Tour de Jean. And uh, they immediately wanted to see the wine cellar. Well, now the French knew they were coming and they had taken most of the wine to another location in Paris, to another old cellar, used old bricks and bricked it in. So when they arrived, they couldn't find most of their famous wine. And they said, well, you know, the depression, we had to sell it off, etc." But this just shows you the lengths to which the Germans went to during the Second World War. And there are other stories that I could go into regarding the theft of rare manuscripts and libraries. Well, here is a picture of Hitler in his bunker, looking at his Linz Museum as the Russian army is closing in in April of 1945. Here's the reality. That's his private sitting room 
right after he had shot himself, the bunker had been overwhelmed. There's a piece of art sitting in the uh, in bad shape in the bunker. Post-war, who owns what? The big immediate problem was who owned it and how are we gonna return this to national museums? And that, was, that became their policy. The works of art would be returned to national museums and not to individuals. This is what they initially decided to do with all this art. The big problem they had was where are you gonna store this art? Most of the major museums of Europe were in ruins. They'd been bombed. Now that wasn't true of the Louvre and the Jeux de Pomme, but most of them, the art could not be returned. Another problem was the return of the gold supply. Here you have an idea of uh, who was owed what. And of course, look at the $2 billion and unaccounted, we did, they didn't know who owned that. Fourth problem was the scope of the loot. Part of the Hermann Goren private collection of loot was, that was taken, this is from his train. This alone is just one piece of it. The variety was unbelievable. Look at this. Just look at this. So one solution and this was temporary, was to store it and bring it on a tour to Washington, some of it. So the U.S. Army asked the National Gallery to hang the art immediately for a reasonable amount of time, about a month. And this opened on March 17, 1948. Here's a picture of the thousands of people that went and looked at the stolen German art, 202 principal paintings. The show closed, about a million people attended at the National Gallery. Most of these pictures were fragile, all on panel. 52 were returned immediately. The rest under military guard was escorted by German curators and they visited major museums, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Boston, Detroit. There was no damage to any of these pictures, which rejoined the rest of the Berlin collection. While they were traveling in the New World, the Berlin airlift came and gone, but many of them were not returned until 1955. And then to the Dalla Museum in the United States sector of West Berlin, not to the shattered Museum Island, which now lay in the Iron Curtain. Today, if you go to Berlin and Museum Island, you can see these paintings, works of art, and tremendous architectural treasures from the ancient world. I had the opportunity to do that not too long ago. However, to this day, much disputed art has not been returned to its owners across Europe. In 2013, Cornelius Gorlitt, son of Hildebrand Gorlitt, the Nazi art dealer, was discovered owning a hoard of over 1,500 works hidden in a German apartment. They included works by Chagall, Aradix, Matisse, and many, many other famous modern artists. He maintained that he had got all these legally owned all these paintings, none came from Nazi confiscation. This uh, particular story is shown in this book, Hitler's Last Hostages, which came out not too long ago. I highly recommend it to you. And in fact, if uh, you send, if you email me, I'll be happy uh, to send you a bibliography of books that I have compiled on uh, this continuing story. Among Gerlitz, his one of the most famous was the woman with a fan. 
estimated value was $20 million. In 2016, an art task force identified 231 works that belonged to the German museums, but were able to identify only five items belonging to individuals. Gerlich died in 2014, and he left his paintings to a Swiss museum. The Swiss and German governments are still disputing the potential owners. In 2014, the French government announced the return of three paintings stolen by the Nazis to their rightful owners. Hundreds more of stolen paintings still hang in French museums. Maria Altman in 1999 tried to, to sue the Austrian government to recover the Golden Adele and other family paintings. The case ended up in the United States Supreme Court and it went to arbitration that she won. The Golden Adele arrived in the United States. It now hangs in the new gallery in New York City right across uh, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Maria's aunt always wanted her portrait to be seen by the public. And in 2015, the, the woman in gold finally got resolved and on display. There are other disputes over Nazi artworks from Hitler's Berlin Chancellery. In the garden were horse sculptures that were designed. They were taken by the Soviets at the fall of Berlin and put in a Russian military base. When the Russians left the horses, they disappeared. But in 2015, a private sale of this Nazi art was discovered and the horses seized by the German government. This Roman bust of the goddess Diana by a French uh, sculptor, Hordon, was stolen by the Russians in World War I in 1920 returned and stolen again by the Nazis in the spring of 2014. A Vienna a auction house discovered it after a private person wanted to sell it. Diana was returned to Warsaw in 2015. There are 63 other thousand artworks still missing from Poland. Then there's the story of the Orpheus clock. 1530, a Nuremberg clock, goldsmith, Wenzel Gentenberger, who lived near Albert Deer, decorated this clock. The case is of gold and bronze. It's covered with intricate high relief depictions of scenes in the legend of Orpheus and the underworld. It is one of the world's most valuable clocks. This story is shown in this book by the son, the great, the grandson of the family, the family that originally owned it. Here's the clock. And this is a picture of Simon Goodman and his brother holding up one of their lost art treasures. This is Edgar Degas landscape with smokestacks. Goodman discovered through a catalog that it was included in the special Degas exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum that identified Mr. and Mrs. Daniel uh, Cyril as the owners. He sent a claim to Cyril regarding it. Cyril handed the claim over to his lawyers. In researching the provenance, they found out that a Paris dealer at the beginning of the war had, had gotten this piece of art and taken, it was taken by the Nazis, placed in the Jeux de Palme. It was taken to Switzerland by an art dealer who collaborated with the Nazis he sold this to his brother-in-law, Swiss dealer, who sold it to an American collector, and the Cyrils bought it from that collector. The Cyrils lawyer disputed the claim. 
the Goodmans filed a lawsuit against Cyril, which attached a lot of attracted a lot of attention. Goodman and his brother were interviewed about it on 60 Minutes, and a Chicago paper ran an editorial about it. A settlement was finally reached before the scheduled trial, with the Goodmans receiving a payment of half of this work's value, which basically paid their legal fees, and with the Cyrils receiving a tax write-off by donating it to the Art Institute. This Degas landscape is now in the Art Institute, labeled from the collection of Friedrich and Louise Goodman. In 1939, there were, well, I'm going to stop here because I have many other stories of other artwork that was confiscated over the years. And right now, an estimated 20% of the artworks currently in European art market were taken during World War II and have not been returned. So this quest continues for justice and the rescue of Europe's World War II stolen art. In many cases, only the harshest light of media exposure seems to provide the motivation for governments, museums, or others to return these stolen art treasures to their original owners. Even though there have been rulings by governments at the Washington principles on, na on Nazi conf confiscated, uh, confiscated art that was signed on by many governments, in the end, in the end, it is only the only enforce they're only as enforceable as the signatory governments and museums and others care to make them. So we will continue to see this story unfold over the next decades as more of this art is revealed and hopefully will be returned. So now let us okay. I'm go gonna, back to screen sharing, right? Yeah, and I'm gonna reclaim host. Right, right here. Whoop. Yeah, so the same place where you shared it, you'll go down and say stop sharing. Right. There we go. All right. So I opened up a lot of can of worms there. <laughs> All but right. You can see, it's a fascinating story. Um, has many different dimensions to it. <laughs> okay. So I just want to unmute Ed here. Okay. So I muted everybody. If you have questions, please put it in the chat. No questions. Comments. And I want to tell you that the slides are, uh, I may have selected them, but uh, they've been displayed because of the artistry and expertise of my wife, Elaine Gordon, <laughs> sitting right here. She was the instruction librarian at DePaul University for 14 years. Thank you, Elaine. <laughs> She's right here, so she deserves a lot of the credit for the visuals you saw. Today. All right. So a uh, question uh, from Jack Oaks. Was there ever any art stolen in Europe found in South America, such as in Brazil? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> but, you know, uh, many uh, of uh, the ex-Nazi officials were able to get passports uh, by various <laughs> means to escape Europe. Um, I, I want to assure everyone, however, that Adolf Hitler died in the bunker. He's not living with Eva Braun in Argentina or his grandchildren. You know, uh, believe me, uh, I, I have another program on killing Hitler <laughs> and all the assassination attempts uh, for this man. But there's a great deal of babble on the internet uh, about uh, uh, various Nazis escaping and getting to South America. Unfortunately, some did. We all know that. The, the Israelis and others have hunted them down. 
I am preparing a program on the Nuremberg trials, by the way. Next year will be the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg trials and the trials in Tokyo against Japanese war criminals. So uh, this is an unending story with many fascinating uh, facets to it. Any other questions? Well, the next time you go to the Art <laughs> Institute, see if you can find landscape with smokestacks. I think, I, I know I've seen it. I don't know if it's on display right now. Oh, there aren't any other questions. I just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, <clears throat> this was really fascinating. And thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you're very, and thank you for having me tonight. And I hope we'll do I'm it again. Sorry about the glitches, but. <laughs> okay. By the time we can meet in person, I'll have it figured out. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks.